Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session on Multiple Future Paths. Um, I'm really honored to be here today with a powerhouse group of individuals who are really leading the way in thinking about career exploration uh, 2.0. And I think taking into account not just that students need to understand what's possible in an ever-changing labor market and have their horizons expanded throughout their educational journeys, but also have that be a social and networked experience where they're actually meeting people who can inspire uh, an array of future possible selves. So I'm going to let my um, colleagues introduce themselves. I'm Julia Freeland Fisher. I'm the Director of Education Research at the Clayton Christensen Institute, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, and I am going to ask of my colleagues that they actually do one extra thing when they introduce themselves. If you can tell us where you work and also share who helped you get where you are today uh, briefly, please spare us your autobiographies. That can be for another South by session. Um, but I'll start with Jean Eady. Thanks, Julia. Uh, I'm Jean Eddy, President and CEO of American Student Assistance. Delighted to be here today. Uh, and I have thought a bit about uh, Julia asking us that question. And I would say that I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Thank heaven someone else saw in me things that I might want to do. And that person was a faculty member actually. And he saw things in me that basically pulled me into higher ed administration I uh, thought I would be good at it and found out that as I was doing it over a bit of time that I absolutely fell in love with it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Sean, I'm gonna call on you next. When did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up, not to age you here, uh, and who helped you get there? Uh, thanks, Julia. Sean McCalmont, I'm the president of Career Learning at Stride Inc., which is formerly K-12. And uh, when I was younger, I actually wanted to be an athlete. And um, I ended up growing up and becoming an athlete. I was an athlete in college and I uh, ran internationally in track and field. And lo and behold, my career ended when I was 23. So there you go. Uh, but I had a backup plan. And you know, you take multiple assessments when you're younger in, in some cases, and I always wanted to help people. So um, I had a mentor who was actually an athletic coach. I had another one who was an educator and one who was a, a, a business person. And um, you know, I ended up advising uh, student athletes, ad advising college students, I went on to manage advisors, got into business, the business of education, but the common denominator is I love helping people. And I think in all of those roles in education, we get to do that, so. Wow, love it. Did not know you were such a Renaissance fan. So I'm gonna <laughs> punt it over to David. Just a hard act to follow, but David, share a little bit about yourself. I'm glad the segue was not I'm gonna punt it over to David who is not a Renaissance man at all. <laughs> um, I certainly am not an athlete of Sean's caliber, although I tried to play sports, um, but I, I never thought my career would go past college. Um, but I, you know, it's interesting for me, especially in this role as CEO of Mentor, I am just like the product of relationship privilege. I mean, I'm the product of white male privilege. I'm the product of relationship privilege. For me, like, there was never one person because there were so many people and they were asking like, what do you want to do? What do you want to explore? And so I got to explore politics in Baltimore city growing up, which made me think a lot about, um, you know, public service. I got to explore nonprofits, even though I more thought about like how you amass money and power and be on the boards of nonprofits versus actually working in one, like I've dedicated my career to. Um, but between the archetype of being an athlete, being the youngest of four, um, and just, you know, being born lucky. Um, I just, there were always mentors around um, and they were family and coaches and teachers and everybody. So very lucky. Awesome. Thank you so much. And certainly last, but certainly not least, I should say, Shabri, share a little bit about where you work and uh, how you figured out what you were going to be when you grew up. Absolutely. Thanks, Julia. I'm Shabri Raja. I'm co-founder and CEO of Nepris. For me, I come from a very different background. I uh, grew up on a rural farm, a coconut farm in South India, two parents without college degree. So my exposure was very, very limited. Went to boarding school at the age of five. So my view of the world was very limited. I did not know what I wanted to do, except that I wanted to get out of the farm and do something else. Right. So for me, the, I had one uncle in my family who was a technology, very successful technology entrepreneur in Bangalore, India, which was the Silicon Valley of India. And at the way my family looked at him and revered him and respected him, he became sort of the linchpin of success for me. 
So while I've had many uh, mentors along the way, I think being um, n having exposure to someone like my uncle who was very successful in a field that was so far away from where I was born into, it just became something to aspire for. So I would say he was very much responsible in a very indirect way to motivate me to aspire for that. Awesome. And Shabri, we're going to hear in a little bit uh, what Nefris is and how I think it tries to scale connections to more uh, literal and figurative uncles uh, for more students. But I want to take a step back, knowing that South by Southwest is really, um, I think, focused on innovation and trying to rethink some of the core assumptions within our traditional education systems. Jean, I think there's a little bit of a myth I'd offer that um, that once you earn a diploma or a degree, then you get a job. But for the innovators in the audience, um, I think even just based on the stories we just heard from you guys, I think that it's dangerous to assume that degree getting and job getting are the same thing. Um, and, and given that, right, given that we actually want students to graduate, not just with a degree or diploma in hand, but also with a plan of what they're gonna do to put that degree and diploma to work, when is the right time to actually start career exploration? What have you guys found in your work at ASA? So I would say that our research at ASA, as well as the combined research of our partners, pretty much points to prime time for really interacting with a young person is when they're in middle school. They are curious, they, are, they don't have too many uh, strongly formed opinions yet, they want to figure things out and they really want to go exploring. Uh, I love the idea of working with a middle school student because they are open to the exploration. There's nothing quite like having a young person figure out what it is they love to do, what kind of skills they might need to do that, and then how that can intersect with some kind of career going forward. I tell my own children, if you can do what you love every day of the week, you never work a day in your life. And it is so true. So middle school, absolutely. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. I think that we know in the education research how pivotal middle school is on social dimensions and on academic ones. And I think this actually echoes a lot of those developmental milestones in terms of how a career trajectory might look. Um, I'm curious, sort of David, when you think about about career exploration, you, you bring it to a totally different angle than the sort of education research lens or the pipeline lens, right? You are in the, the business, for lack of a better term, of relationships. Um, and in the wake of COVID-19, you are hard pressed to find a single educator who would not say relationships matter, right? We've actually seen how deeply relationships matter for engagement. But um, I'm wondering, uh, if you think about relationships mattering for career exposure and career exploration, how does mentor think about that relationship? How does mentor think about um, relationships themselves as a predictor of future success and career success? Yeah, so I don't know whether now is the time to pander to the moderator, but I could do that the whole time because I think a lot of what you have said, which has married the world through Christensen, married education and relationship and mentoring and youth development is that sort of this old adage, right? Of we sort of get what we measure, right? And so we started becoming obsessed with measuring standardized tests. So if I'm a teacher, like I could be the most loving, skilled teaching professional in the history of the world, I'm going to be really good at getting kids ready for a test. I mean, that's if you go to a good school or a high performing school, it's all the test. It's nothing else. It's not you know, in a lot of places, it's not measured on a whole lot else. Obviously, in the private marketplace, you've got sort of like who will pay for it. But in the public marketplace, most of the rankings are based on that. And so, you know, we've often looked at relationship as a means to an end. I think the shift, and so that's how we try to get attention, right? In the mentoring field, we've said relationship will lead to attendance. You, some of your school funding comes through attendance. Relationship will lead to doing better on the standardized test because if kids' social emotional needs aren't met, then they won't do as well academically. So it's been relationship is the gateway to unlocking other things, to unlocking the career exposure that Gene just talked about so powerfully to sort of occupational identity and what you think you can be. The question is, the question is, and will COVID-19 shift us in this or not? Is this our chance to hashtag build it back better? Will relationship be looked at as an end outcome? And that's what you've coined so well. Will we say that we judge a school 
by whether a kid graduates with a network of eight people from the school and outside the school that she can say are her network. That would be a totally different definition of a, a successful school and a sense of what they want to do with their career, whether it be higher ed or so. I, I mean, I think it's it's you you know it's redefining what school is. And I don't know whether the pandemic will cause that. I certainly hope so. Um, I think what we've learned so far is basically the kids that we were least well serving before the pandemic were even less well serving now. And that has a lot to do with our ability to create connection and treat students like they have a whole contextual life and not just they're showing up to take standardized tests. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. And for listeners, you know, what David is very graciously alluding to is that um, I've done a lot of work on the role of social capital in accessing opportunities. So if we think about career exposure as a trajectory that hopefully to Jean's point starts in middle school with access to role models, for example, access to a variety of visions of your future possible self, the reality is those role models down the line uh, or different individuals can turn into a network that actually makes it more likely you access a job given that half of jobs come through personal connections. So I think that's to just uh, connect what Jean was observing and, and David, I think your push for social capital is an outcome in its own right. Um, Sean, so Sean sort of quickly glossed over in his introduction. I wanna clarify what Sean does uh, and then explain my question to you. So Sean heads up career solutions at Stride Inc, which is formerly K-12 Inc for context. Um, so really thinking about career exposure and experience. Um, I wanna sort of delineate those two at scale. And I think Sean at conferences like these, um, there's like this big bundle of like career readiness. I have a personal mission to call it career optionality instead of readiness um, from an equity lens. But I, I think there's some fear that targeted career technical education programs can devolve into tracking students rather than expanding their horizons. Rather than again, I'm gonna keep coming back to this idea of many future possible selves, athlete or education corporate executive, right? In your case. Um, so what are the best approaches or tools that you're seeing to help young people see a broad array of career paths and, and maybe share best practices either from Stride or you guys have so many partnerships in the space, others doing exciting work? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Julia. You know, first of all, we, we changed our name to Stride because we really feel that the, the career continuum, if you, if you will, um, starts uh, maybe even earlier than middle school in our view. Now we, we're with Jean, we, we have an intense middle school exploration program, but you know, I think many, many schools are starting to look at what, what are K through five um, skill sets that really relate to career development and career confidence down the road. And, and then we've recently acquired um, three adult training uh, companies, uh, Galvanize, uh, MedCerts and Tech Elevator, which are IT and, and allied health healthcare um, uh, training institutions. And so we, we want to make sure that, that students anywhere in that continuum have a view of multiple paths toward career success. So we, we do that in a couple of ways. Now, uh, we have Shabri with us today and, and we, we are really honored to have her as a business partner. Um, many of our students are uh, you know, on the NEPRIS platform talking to industry professionals. And, and, and we actually start uh, students talking to industry professionals, working in virtual teams in middle school without a distinct career pathway so that they can be int introduced to project-based learning, uh, working in virtual teams, uh, you know, working with collaborative software tools, et cetera, which we feel are just foundational uh, elements of a sort of modern uh, work environment. So if they can start gaining that type of broad career experience early on, by the time they, they figure out a pathway or decide to, you know, sort of uh, explore post high school graduation uh, pathway, they've got a set of, of, of skills that can help them actually look at multiple uh, ways of, of moving past high school. So we are all about optionality as well. If a student can think about themselves in terms of uh, a pathway that's not linear uh, anymore. It, it could sort of be circuitous. Uh, it could go through multiple uh, layers of education, but the, the end goal is this continual development of those early skills they, they, uh, they gained um, in their experience with us. And, and by the time that they've, they've gone post-graduation, they might decide to work while they're going to school 
they might decide to go to technical training um, and then work or, or go to work and have their employer pay for their um, four-year education. There are so many different options. Um, so not just uh, by industry, but also by route. And, and so Julie, I think you're 100% right. If we can expose them to those, those options early on, we feel that their, their ability to gain career confidence is accelerated. And by the way, we found that you can do that virtually in many ways. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, we love Shabri's uh, platform at Nepris because it's a direct uh, tie to industry professionals. But we also uh, launched a, um, a job shadow week where we gave students an opportunity to rotate through uh, sessions with multiple companies. And, and they might not be interested in any, they might be interested in multiple, but they got to ask questions of those industry professionals in a way that is, is a is sort of a round robin, um, just learn. You know, you don't have to engage with, with one or the other. And so many opportunities to do that uh, along the way for, for not only Stride, but many other uh, education institutions. Yeah, Sean, I wanna just pull on one strand there and then Shabri will come over to you to talk about the power of technology to do all these wonderful things that we're, we've been framing up to, the, to date. But, um, you know, I think Sean, your push on it's not linear is, is a core message for the career exposure and exploration space because it's very tempting from a sort of top-down standpoint to wanna to just have a, a perfect line beginning to end of where a student starts and where that student ends up. Um, and yet all of our stories that we shared, I think didn't reflect that. And so the question maybe for the next, next 10, 15 minutes, I want um, all the panelists to keep in mind is like, how do you systematize a nonlinear system, a nonlinear journey? Um, because I think that's the challenge if we're really gonna make this a student-centered um, kind of uh, approach to career exposure and exploration. So Shabri, um, I have a specific question for you in light of COVID a little bit, but I think what your story illustrated, right, is the power of one individual to shift your mindset, uh, mm -hmm. almost regardless of your circumstances, or in your case, sort of in spite of your circumstances, the role that your uncle, and I know others in your life were willing to play. And, and I think this year, in particular, um, those sparks or those relationships were really out of reach for a lot of students, mm -hmm. uh, just because they weren't able to come to school. Um, you and I know that's not a new problem, though. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious to hear about how you're thinking about using technology to reach more students with more uh, access to sort of career exposure. And maybe you can just give the audience a quick summary of what the heck Nepros is, because we've all been not giving it a nod. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Thanks, uh, Julia. So basically, you know, Nepros was founded with the mission to bring equity of access using technology to bridge the gap between industry and education. So the, the goal has always been how do we use um, a technology solution to connect thousands of students irrespective of where they live and who they are to opportunities from around the country and around the world. So that's basically what we do. We sit in the middle of educators and industry professionals and make this connection really possible and accessible to every single classroom, no matter where they are. A large percentage of our users are rural schools. Like last year, post COVID, we've seen an increase in rural school districts really reaching out for access. I mean, one good example is the Arkansas Department of Education. They launched NEPRIS for over 285 of their small rural school districts because they realized even more so post COVID that access uh, is so important. So um, your other question, Julia, really, uh, where I believe um, you can really expand the student horizons is you, you say this very well in your book, Who You Know. Uh, it's how do we connect more students to more people uh, across the world and across the country? It's the weak tie opportunities, you know? Um, while, you know, I myself am grateful for having mentors who've helped me along the way, uh, when we are especially talking about going um, to younger and younger grade levels. You know, we actually have a very high usage in elementary, surprisingly. Um, but at those points, it's about how do you integrate? You know, we don't want to look at 
career exposure as something that happens once a year during career days. You know, how we want to change perspective is this should be part of your day to day teaching and learning. For that, you need a technology platform to make that happen. You need to start thinking about if I am teaching, um, you know, solar power in my fourth grade elementary classroom, my kids are working on a solar powered cooker, how can I connect them with the renewable energy expert? It's not only bringing relevance to learning, but in the process, bringing exposure. That's what we've been focused on. We don't look at career exposure as a separate standalone thing that happens somewhere on the side, but for really a scalable change to happen, to, to really make impact on influencing students at a large scale level, it needs to be integrated into your day-to-day -day classroom. And that can only happen through many, many weak type connections that is tied to what they're learning in the classroom. It's not just your STEM classes, it's not just math and science. If you're in a social studies classroom, you know, if you're in an ELA classroom, how can you connect with the children's book author? If you're in a social studies classroom, how can you connect with people who are working in that field? You know, you work, you want to connect with maybe people in public service and government, you know, so that's the kind of change we're looking at. And that's how the schools have to shift their mentality. And technology can play a huge role in bringing that kind of scale. Weak tie connections are the first step to career exposure, which can eventually, as they grow older, lead into more stronger one-on-one -on -one connections. Awesome, thanks Shabri. I mean, I'll editorialize right now as the moderator, I'm not supposed to do this, but I do think that as we look post COVID now that the vaccine is in sight and I think there's uh, inevitable conversations about what's gonna remain in place when, when schools go quote unquote back to normal, Everything Shabri is talking about is what we've seen in our research is the competitive advantage of tech, which is to diversify weak tie connections, not to replace high touch mentoring connections. Um, and if depending on where audience members are sort of in the pipeline, if you're trying to get someone a job in a very particular industry, you need strong ties and mentors. If you're trying, as, as Jean so, so aptly pointed out, to expand horizons and sense of possibility, you need a bunch of weak ties. So I think everything you're saying, I hope, has some staying power. Let's stick with technology for a second. Jean, I wanna go back to you. Um, ASA has produced a tool called Futurescape that I think is really designed to help students, meet students where they are at, I should say, mm -hmm. and then see what is possible. Can you just talk a little bit about what that tool is and, and how students have, have started to access it to date? Uh, certainly, so last May we launched, and, and certainly we, this was in development prior to COVID, but I think about it in the event of COVID that we were trying to bring career exploration and exploration of one's talents and abilities to kids where they are, as you, so, as you put it. Um, we designed it uh, through a mobile device rather than on a platform with a PC or a Mac, because we know that about 94% of kids within our demographic uh, use cell phones. They have access to cell phones and they use them. So we decided to go out and work with kids where they are and give them an opportunity to go with career exploring. And I would have to say it's really fun. So I can't encourage, everybody should try it. Go to Futurescape uh, at ASA.org um, to really get a sense of its gameplay initially to discover talents and interests. And then it opens up a universe of possibilities for people to go and see young people to see those skills and abilities, how they could interact or intersect with a given career path. Uh, and it doesn't have to be one, it's multiples of a career path. If you like math or if you like science, you can go in a myriad of directions. And then from there, you start to learn more about what those careers are, the kind of education you might need. And to, to um, follow on to being a Nepris fan, you also get an opportunity to go out and see what people in the field actually do if they want to be an astrophysicist, as an example. They also have access to mentors because we have a relationship with a mentor organization to be able to go and talk to someone to really kind of think through what that might happen to be. Um, what has been very, very heartening about this is that not only have we had over 3 million young people go onto this platform since May, but we have kids using this platform from every state in, in the union, every single one. And it's not a case of kids in a certain demographic use it, everybody's using it. Uh, I would have to say, with a smile on my face, young women seem to like it more than young men but that's our challenge to solve. 
that's for 2021 it sounds like yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So, so check out Futurescape and, and maybe given the partnership, David, that Jean mentioned, uh, you know, I think that um, anytime I talk to people about career access and exploration, the power of mentors comes up, but you and I have also talked about the fact that mentor is a very loaded word and it can mean many things. Um, so curious amidst this pandemic, as you look at your affiliates in the space, maybe those that are partnering with Futurescape and others, what's working? <laughs> what's working in a digital capacity that might actually outlast COVID-19, particularly when it comes to putting more career mentors um, and role models in reach for more young people? Yeah, so I, I first wanna say that, you know, we just, Futurescape just sort of ASA exhibited Futurescape at the National Mentoring Summit. And I think often Shabri and I were actually discussing this a little bit in our prep call, mentoring and sort of like these tech tools and weak ties get pitted against each other as a zero sum game. When, when you actually talk to people in the field, they're looking for complementary tools. So like the mentoring people were psyched about Futurescape because they can lever it. The mentors can't be all things to all kids. They don't know everything a kid wants to do. So I think when we can pair technology tools with human connection, like lots of really cool things can, can happen is one, what I would say. Um, I also do, just to be dark for a second, I know you asked me for solutions, but I also want to be a realist about the way this pandemic magnifies inequity because we could end up being people who sit around and say that disruption and innovation is going to solve for racial injustice and inequity. And the bottom line is when we go out to mentoring programs who are doing a great job trying to maintain connection, the digital divide and the access to devices is a huge issue as is literacy. People used to always come to me and say like, I can solve the mentoring gap with an app. Well, there's a lot of kids that don't have access and also just writing back and forth to a human may not be something they're totally confident in. So I think the idea here is about orientation and rigor. That's all it's about. It's about orientation, rigor, and intentionality. There are tools that will work for solving for different things. And, and I think all the panelists have talked about like just making sure that the tool is proportional to the issue and that it solves a part of the problem. I think there's also a design challenge and that's something ASA is helping us with, which is actually doing design engagements with schools to say, so you want to be a relationship centered district, which, you know, there are models out there that you've highlighted like summit and big picture and others who are not, you know, who are not sort of public districts, but have shown as network schools how to put relationship in the center and make that an outcome of success. So I think I just would say, again, complementary, virtual and in-person and mentoring organizations are having to learn that. What once was sort of like a threat or second class is like, I've got to hybrid this and find new tools like Nepris and Futurescape and everything. Um, I think we've got to design with intention and rigor um, and, and proportionality. And then I still think we have structural inequities that make this like not easy to solve with any one thing because the funding in a school, the digital divide, these are all implications that make it easier said than done for people to take these tools, take this design and actually, you know, use them if you're under amazing pressure in a school district. Um, I would just add, I think advocacy is huge too. And while we're about to invest a lot of money through hopefully through a recovery package in education, the question will be, you know, <laughs> what will that get used for? And we all have a role to play in seeing how that's actually deployed. Yeah, I mean, just two strands there, David. I think rebranding hybrid as the sort of best of both worlds <laughs> might be a, a task to surmount post pandemic, but it's the real opportunity if you combine high touch, high tech, high tech, high touch. There's a bunch of uh, permutations of that to pay attention to. Um, and I think also important, just David's being a little bit modest, but he and his colleague Liz Santiago have been creating with ASA's partnership, an entire sort of a set of pilots and designs around relationship centered schools that to my point about systematizing this, I think will be a huge contribution to the field over the year to come. Um, Sean, I just want you to get in here as someone who has a bird's eye view of this market um, and, and sort of scaling solutions. I wanna talk about alignment a little bit, aligning students' strengths and interests, because if we get too broad with this notion of career exploration, we're like replicating the internet and just sort of say, okay, just go explore everything in the world without coherence. 
Um, so how do you at, at Stride think about al aligning to what students may be interested in or discovering they're interested in and then sort of putting skills and knowledge around those interests? Oh, you're muted. It's a great question and, and great, just as great a, a challenge. But, but I do feel that, you know, I, I go back to this concept of building uh, confidence along the way. We learn a lot about the students and their interests, you know, every step of the way. And if we can look at incremental development toward career, career interest, we, we end up finding that that alignment happens sort of on its own. But we also uh, put a lot of resources around the multitude of interests that can uh, come. And that's why we keep looking at um, new acquisitions, uh, content that we can bring from industry professionals and industry training to the high school level, uh, et cetera. So it's just giving them more uh, option, more access to, to that type of content. Awesome, yeah, I do think it's a, a sort of puzzle of bringing together mm -hmm. diverse content and then matching those to pathways. Um, we're almost at time, so I'm gonna end us with a lightning round here. You know, you have my panelists, we have in front of us in the South by audience, entrepreneurs, innovators, funders, disruptors, who David may not be fond of, but are trying to disrupt everything, um, and, and leaders and, and educators in our system who I think are trying their best to reach all students right now to expand their sense of what's possible uh, in their future. So lightning round is, um, for anyone trying to expand career exposure and opportunities, what's one big takeaway? Um, Shabri, I'll start with you. Jean, you're up next just to give you a heads up. <laughs> Absolutely, um, Julia. I mean, we all know that uh, while skills and social capital are equally important, but the foundation of uh, building students for future of work is the occupational identity. What they believe they can be, they cannot believe in anything if they don't know what exists out there. So exposing students to a wide range of possibilities, diverse people, role models, places, workplace experiences, it's going to be so important. And this work cannot be done at scale without the help of technology and virtual. Post COVID, I think this has become even more important, so. Jean? Uh, I will agree with everything that Shabri just said. I would just add, please, let's start earlier. Let's start early in middle school. Sean? Yeah, I think that the pandemic has shown us that um, just like we're working here and, and operating in a virtual environment, uh, young people can as well. And they're developing some amazing technical skills that we hope will actually last them a lifetime and prepare them for a modern workplace. So although it's been challenging, I think they're developing some underlying skills that will really benefit them long term. David, take us home. Yeah, I would just say, um, it's impossible to sum up this all-star crew, but I would just say uh, pair exposure connection and opportunity. We can do all three. They don't work without each other. They're not competitors. Pair all three and redefine what ed educational success is. If we start there, I think we can build a better system. I could not have said it better myself, David. Um, I want to share with all the uh, participants in this session, all our audience members, that ASA has a booth um, that you can go visit that actually has a whole bunch of resources that all of us pulled ahead of this session. Um, so go there, check out tools, research, um, books, uh, and other web resources that uh, might be useful for you guys to put all these ideas into action in your context. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you.